So the next question <coughs> is, myocardial is a disorder in which heart muscle is structurally and functionally abnormal. That's fine up to that point. And then comes the question of, do we call cardiomyopathy? If in the absence of ischemic heart disease, valvular heart disease and those sorts of things, or not? Let's look at some of those interesting definitions. So WHO first started somewhere in 1980 saying uh, this is a heart muscle disease of unknown origin. So trying to get that you know ischemic heart disease this this out of that equation. All right, and they thought okay they sat on it for quite a while, and then in '95 they thought in association with the International Society and Federation of Cardiology, uh, then they included all causes. They said yeah it includes ischemic heart disease, valvular heart disease, everything. Okay. Um, the Americans were surprisingly quiet for a while, um, and then uh, sorry, um, yeah, and then the WHO uh, classified them as dilated, uh, hypertrophic, restrictive, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, and then you had the unclassified cardiomyopathies. Then 2006, then came the AHA definition. So essentially, they said something similar. Okay, it's a heart muscle disease plus this 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 and they also included uh, iron channelopathies so then they said cardiomyopathies either are confined to the heart or are part of a generalized systemic disorders often leading to cardiovascular death or progressive heart failure and then they said will exclude this IHT or you know, valvular heart disease and blah, blah, blah. So we're not going to include them. So we'll just exclude them and have it as cardiomyopathy. Then they said we'll have primary cardiomyopathy, secondary. <coughs> and primary is obviously involving the heart. Uh, uh, secondary is other organ system involvement. So under primary, you had the genetic mixed and the non-genetic. And under genetic with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic and the non-compaction one and mixed was the dilated and the restrictive cardiomyopathy and then you had this broken heart syndrome and variety of others which were acquired so they they said the aim of our classification is to give an understanding of this complex group of disorders of course as i said they excluded hypertensive if it's secondary to hypertension or ischemic heart disease or valvular heart disease so the europeans thought let's wait till the americans modify some more and see what we can do so they waited for a couple of years and then they came at oh uh, yeah it's we do agree with the americans we'll include all of that they are saying except will not accept iron channelopathies so what they um, they said yeah no hypertension no valvular disease congenital but as long as there's a structural functional abnormality call it cardiomyopathy but exclude iron channelopathies so they have to be a little bit different okay um I think Indians, Australians, Britons kept quiet for a long. Uh, is there anything from the IACTA that anybody knows? It's no. fine. Not yet. <laughs> All right. Uh, then there was the Moog's classification. So what this did was they had this like a phenotype, genotype based nomenclature for cardiomyopathy. And this was endorsed by the World Heart Federation and published in 2013. Then th this is basically like a TNM staging for other cancers. They thought we'll use this as a um, prognosis, a staging of the prognosis. All right. So they said, okay, M is a morphofunctional, which indicates a descriptive phenotypic diagnosis, which is the dilated, and O for the or if there are any organ extra cardiac organ involvement. G genetic or familial inheritance and if there's some etiological description of the specific cause and as they said was a functional side of it now after all those things what did the americans do 2013 guidelines american college of cardiology they still started calling ischemic cardiomyopathy then the other heart failure society of american guidelines in 2010 still continue to use them so they still continue to use as ischemic cardiomyopathy. So I'm, I'm actually quite confused. Which of the American ones should we accept? Anyway, I think in a nutshell, any structural or functional abnormality. Um, to some extent, 1995 WHO is reasonably fine, 
um, at the same time this is Aji Baji thing about both of them saying yes and no now let's go to the echocardiogram evaluation um, I always say that in general systolic dysfunction is characteristic of dilated cardiomyopathy and diastolic dysfunction of both hypertrophic as well as the restrictive let's um, have a bit more look at the uh, dilated cardiomyopathy the incidence is somewhere on 5 to 8 cases per 100,000 and prevalence of 36 uh, and obviously the clinical features of heart failure very characteristics of the dilated one is it's a dilation and impaired contraction of one or both ventricles so once it's severe invariably it's accompanied by an increase in cardiac mass so this is what you see this is a classic when it's advanced dilated cardiomyopathy almost all the four chambers are dilated and see the LV is a bit more spherical so the LV cavity has got spherical dilatation as you saw in the previous slide normal or decreased wall thickness and poor contractility the fractional shortening area change and the ejection fraction are all reduced and as you saw the previous slide too, there may be left atrial enlargement sometimes less often with the uh, right RV2 so is it playing yeah good no, not doesn't play on my thing so now with this one this is actually ischemic in brackets cardiomyopathy so patient actually came for CAGS and had this picture I'm not sure why it's not playing on my oh, anyway go to the next one sorry I think I may have I don't know why it's not something is playing oh good um, uh, this again if you look at the LV cavity there uh, there's hardly any movement this is a typical uh, cardiomyopathic picture um, <coughs> is that moving yeah. Yeah, then again you can see there very clearly that entire the LV cavity and the endocardial movements there is just not moving much so this is another I'm not sure why okay yeah, it's supposed to be full screen so I'll just sort of this yeah yeah that's better sorry in between I shouldn't have touched there yeah. um, this is again classic uh, description of the dilated cardiomyopathy and if you look at the mitral leaflets there um, it's and the analyst they just been dragged and usually it is associated with some amount of mitral regurge and you can see the mitral regurge there this is again the short axis view transgastric short axis view this is just seeing the wobbly movement there and this is actually the trans thoracic uh, image again is an apical view uh, where there is massive dilatation of the LV cavity now in this picture this is just the normal uh, M mode across the LV in the basal segment of parasternal long axis view on a trans thoracic echo and if you look here this is the septum and this is the inferior lateral wall and this is the uh, mitral leaf light that's the E wave the E point sorry see the proximity of the E point to the septum and that's quite normal all right and in a dilated cardiomyopathy this is what you find is there's quite a bit of a distance there all right so there's an increased separation of the mitral leaflet E point from the septum and when you look at the M mode across the normal aortic valve and see how this is a uh, diagrammatic part of it and if you see the M mode here is the aortic valve then it's closing off similar what it's done okay there is no sloping at all but with this one there's an early closure in this dilated cardiomyopathy 
there's an early closure from the reduced stroke volume can you see this one here and all the end all the volume indices are all much more higher than normal in um, dilated cardiomyopathy okay now the you all sometimes get a young athlete and then you look at the heart and say oh looks a bit big and why is that but however in a young athlete you don't find any of those uh, m mode characteristics that we have gone through okay still you'll have a normal m mode appearance so now when you place a uh, dop that's in the doppler section uh, vta of the lvot is decreased normally we know it's 15 to 25 uh, mitral regurgitation is a constant feature of dilated cardiomyopathy as i mentioned before usually mild to moderate um, and the mitral inflow patterns and the pulmonary vein uh, with the tissue doppler image and gives information about the diastolic dysfunction or progress to pulmonary hypertension uh, this is again actually basically what I called previously as an ischemic cardiomyopathy. Uh, it's a bit more moderate uh, mitral regurgitation. And now we go to the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is a uh, heterogeneous uh, disorder caused by a variety of mutations, mostly genetic in nature. The classic feature being uh, this interventricular septum is involved most of the time. However, it can involve any wall and it can produce any shape. And so, if you see something, a concentric hypertrophy, it can still be the HCM. If you see uh, just the sigmoid, or you can find different variants in this. So, it can still be the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. All right? But typically, just the interventricular septum and the diagnosis based on a LV thickness of more than 13. Some of them mention 15 millimeters. Um, in one or more LV segments without apparent cause or a ratio of septal to inferior lateral wall thickness of more than 1.3. Now to differentiate between the athlete's heart, sometimes I do tell people, young guys who are into the gym and lot of the athletic work, I often tell them have a baseline echo, especially when even my nephew who is a power lifting fellow and he was in Sydney lifting up heavy weights, and I keep telling, but they often they don't listen. That's normal when you get a give a free advice. Um, so yeah, they LVH is generally symmetric, and wall thickness is generally about 12, can go up to 16. Uh, they found that the black women athletes have a greater degree of LVH and repolarization abnormalities than the white women. Um, just genetic, uh, and hypertrophic is predominantly genetic. And based on the site and extent of the hypertrophy, one can develop one or more of these abnormalities. So having a left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, diastolic dysfunction, myocardial ischemia, because they can pre present with even chest pain and MR as well. And how do they do that? So that we know is a concentric hypertrophy. And this could be, we don't, unless we patient volunteers, yeah, I've got high, put, high blood pressure or high stenosis, and it's very hard. Now, and, but however, when you do a M mode across, you still have a normal ejection fraction. I think we had a bit of a discussion this morning with high stenosis. You know, the ejection fraction is 40. Normally, it would have been 50, 60. All right. So, um, with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you still have a normal ejection fraction. And now going to what are, how, what's the mechanism, what happens in, with the LVOT obstruction. Now, if you look at this image closely, see when they oppose each other. Um, do you have a pointer? Sorry. So, if we look at, as this is, sorry, the parasitic long axis view, I've still got another video in the transesophageal as well, uh, I'll show you that. So, in here, when they oppose, can you see the anterior mitral leaflet, part of it coming into the LVOT, producing a SAM effect. So, what happens is that when there is a high velocity uh, blood flow, pressure surges, it's actually maximum where there is obstruction. 
okay they grade in slot and then beyond this obstruction the pressure everything is normal as it happens in the aortic valve all right so as this high velocity blood goes approaches the obstruction there is a venturi effect created so with the venturi effect it pulls the anterior mitral leaflet into the lvot and worsens the obstruction and in addition if the patient becomes hypovolemic it gets even worse all right and that's why we often tell these athletes everyone keep hydrating yourself well okay so what are those factors that lead to this mitral septal contact is that there's a narrow diameter of the lvot due to increased septal wall thickness itself all right then they're apically so apically positioned papillary muscles that tether the mitral valve plane toward the ventricular septum so di displays more apically and elongated anterior leaflet of the mitral leaf and mechanism as i've just explained to you um, that it pulls and causes a regurgitation uh, sorry uh, obstruction so that's where it is so high velocity blood creates a venturi effect pulls the anterior leaflet i hope i'm showing the right thing pulls the anterior leaflet into the LVOT and causes the obstruction. Okay. Now, SAM normally involves the anterior mitral leaflet. However, it can involve the cordae and the posterior mitral leaflet. Um, then this is again another just still picture just showing the hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy without obstruction and that's the other one is with obstruction. So the other thing then that people start thinking, oh, should we do cath procedures for all of them to estimate the gradient? Um, so they compared with a resting LVOT gradient of more than 50, uh, associated with the SAM and MR. They found that the LVOT pressure gradient at cath correlates well with the Doppler velocities and with the duration of the SAM septal contact. So that's why they said now they recommend no rational to undergo cath procedure for assessment of LVOT gradients. Um, again, the presence of a central or anteriorly directed MR jet suggests the presence of intrinsic mitral valve disease. So as I mentioned, so when the mitral leaf, anterior mitral leaf is pulled into the LVOT, this is a posteriorly, because the posterior leaflet cannot make up too much or come forward to meet the anterior leaflet. So as a result, there's a posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation. Okay, but however, if it's anterior or central, then you got to think about the mitral valve itself. So they have some of the gradings um, <clears throat> with the systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. I won't go too much into the detail. I'll go to the next case. Uh, this is a 60-year-old who uh, this this gentleman presented about a couple of days before I flew into India. Um, present with post uh, STEMI with a triple vessel disease, non-diabetic, hypercholesterolemia, non-hypertensive uh, for CAGs and medications did include metoprolol and this was the pre-bypass. You can see that this is asymmetric hypertrophy there. Okay, not much around here. Everything is looking fine. You don't see any SAM effect there. Um, not much. You can hardly see, barely see any mitral regurge. Again, there's nothing out there. There's no turbulence here. The next one should be better. So it, there's no turbulence. So there's absolutely no SAM effect at all. All right, this pre-bypass. And again, reinforcing the same thing, uh, showing the septal hypertrophy. Now, we did uh, usual uh, ENA waves to make sure whether any diastolic dysfunction didn't appear. So, um, even with the pulmonary vein uh, flows, nothing significant. And that's the pulmonary one. And then the tissue Doppler. Uh, again, nothing significant to say. It's there's a uh, isolate dysfunction. All right. Um, this, yeah, this is a short axis view of the um, uh, LV cavity there, and just measuring 1.5, and that's about uh, 1.2. Just the upper limit of normal. Um, okay. Now we are in action. Now this is post bypass. All right, and. In the post bypass, immediately we had the pacing around 88, 
and this is what you are having a look at. Can you observe that there is something flipping into the LV cavity? As it is, the LV cavity is smaller, and as they meet, there seems to be something flipping in there. Um, does that look better now? Can you appreciate that or not still convinced? Can you see a part of the AML coming into the LVOT? And this is some of the measurements that I took. It's probably about the 0.7. Less than 10. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't do anything, I just touched only the arrow mark there. Sorry, so did it? What happened? I just closed it. It's just closed. Right? So, um, must be my computer. <coughs> so, the next slide will actually show. When that hydrogen molecule thread has come into the LVOD and the distance from there to the septum, and that's got much closer. So obviously there was already a SAM effect as a result of this. So I did have a 3D image, including of the you know the septum and all of that, and also to show 3D color from a normal mind. There was absolutely no mind regurg developed a posteriorly directed jet. Unfortunately, when I transferred the 3D images, I thought everything was transferred out using the AVI. And in the flight, I was trying to reorganize slides, and I couldn't find them, uh, the 3D images there. Right down. Okay. Um, Sorry, what the heck up?
to complete diagnostic management. So that was it. This is still Fred. The uh, spectral training has got a role and should be used the first time. Uh, there are other variants, as I mentioned before, apical and obstructive and others. I won't go too much into the details. There is some of the other features. Mm. And there are some differences between the obstructive hyper hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in an elderly versus the young. Um, LVH is more severe in the young. And how are the other features, the predict rate and everything is a lot less in the younger individuals. And severe EAS is unlikely in the young people. Um, just quickly, over the restrictive cardiomyopathy, uh, it's characterized by a non-dilated LV with impaired ventricular filling. So hypertrophy is typically absent, except maybe in infiltrative and storage disease, like you know amyloidosis or something like that. Uh, also referred to as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So it causes amyloidosis, hemochromatosis, sarcoidosis, scleroderma. Uh, the echo features are low or normal diastolic volume. Normal or only mildly reduced ejection fraction. They could be atrial enlargement or bi-atrial enlargement. Uh, normal pericardium. Um, sometimes uh, people do get confused between the constrictive pericarditis and uh, 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 restrictive. Uh, and if it has a patchy granular sparkling appearance, generally it's amyloidosis. Um, this is just to show again, um, this is a Doppler to the pulmonary vein where the systolic blunting is present. Again showing uh, impaired relaxation, sorry, restrictive pattern there. Uh, again you can see the LV cavity is not bigger into that, but there is a bilateral dilatation. Uh, this is a diastolic phase where during inspiration and expression, so in construction it actually is normal and then whereas restrictive cardiomyopathy it remains the same, there is no change in the amplitude there. Uh, again this is just showing the bilateral dilatation. Then we got the arrhythmogenic RV, right ventricular cardiomyopathy, genital determined RV free wall is replaced by fibrous and fibro uh, fatty tissue with scattered residual myocardial cells. RV function is abnormal, sometimes it leads to ventricular dilatation and dysfunction. The others, like uh, I'll just quickly run through this couple of videos of non compaction, they're very <coughs> interesting. Um, so, what happens with the non compaction is this continuity between the LV cavity and the deep intratrabecular recess that are filled with blood without evidence of communication to the epicardial system. And this you'll come to know. So it has got that communication. You can see the trabecular recess there. And in this video, you can clearly see the trabeculations there. Channels all into the LV muscle. This is another video showing the color seeping into that non compaction LV. And again, this is the transthoracic apical pore chamber uh, showing the non compaction there. Same thing. Okay, just a closer look. Then we all are aware uh, stress induced cardiomyopathy. A lot of them get this on the Valentine's Day when they don't get a rose. Uh, but some of them, when they lose their near and dear ones, uh, tend to. I had a 70 year old lady one month back, lost her husband came and she was fine, she was sitting there, nothing, just for a pre anesthetic check for a surgery and suddenly the ECG showed terribly abnormal, we walked her up and down and it was really bad, uh, sent to the cardiologist, colon is normal but just a stress induced cardiomyopathy. So there was apical ballooning uh, there with a transient systolic dysfunction. So the basal segments are moving but the apical segment just ballooned out and the same thing here in the apical transthoracic views see this is hardly moving but they tend to recover uh, the cirrhotic is another one I won't deal with it too much so in a nutshell uh, hyper you've got to understand differences I'm not sure what sort of a definition you're going to be likely to use after my presentation each one of them but one is if they're structurally abnormal and functionally abnormal uh, with or without any secondary cause, you could follow the WHO IFSC or the American Europeans. Okay. Um, but again, they themselves change their tune. Uh, so hopefully you have uh, 
Mine's white, right? <laughs>